Okay, as we were talking about the storm earlier, I was mentioning that because, you know, with the darkness and everything, it's hard to assess the damages and all that. And it's going to take literally days before we know the full impact of what happened with Hurricane Ian and whether or not he's actually going to be upgraded uh, posthumously, if you will, looking back at a, a you know Category 5. But we do know now, according to the Lee County Sheriff, the fatalities are in the hundreds in Lee County. And so... Um, so far, that's what they know. Uh, and again, we have to say, we have to preface everything we say with so far because the information is going to be changing quite a bit, uh, quite sure, because of a storm of this magnitude, the strength of this storm, the power that this storm carried, uh, the kind of winds that this storm had. And that's what I was saying about it might be upgraded to a Cat 5. It came on shore officially as a Cat 4 at 155 miles per hour. Text 158 for it to be a Cat 5, and they believe that there were some places that actually had that happen, so they might go back and reclassify. Now, today, as we stand here today, um, he's down to about a 60, 65-mile-per-hour wind as a tropical storm, and they really, forecasters don't expect any kind of strengthening, even as he goes out over the warm Atlantic, uh, that he won't be able to rebuild and re- reconstitute and you know uh, get back to a Category 1. It'll probably stay a tropical storm moving up, to the mid-Atlantic and going back in somewhere in northern Georgia or into the Carolinas and then going over to the Appalachian Mountains and kind of dying over there. The Sanibel Causeway did collapse as the hurricane was coming ashore. Now, that's the causeway that we talked about yesterday that leads over to Sanibel Island. I'm very familiar with that island, the man who used to own this radio station. Um, his family continues to own. He's, he's passed away, but his family now continues to own Waterman Broadcasting in that area, NBC Channel 2. And there's a story about NBC Channel 2, and I'll tell you that story a little bit later on. But um, uh, they were uh, certainly, uh, they they lived on that uh, island in, the, in that area, and that causeway did collapse yesterday. Now, we were told yesterday by officials that they had gotten everybody off of those islands just outside of Fort Myers, and I certainly hope that that's true because those islands had to have been just absolutely decimated, and those homes had to have been decimated. Uh, On the mainland of of Fort Myers, where it is, which is basically an island too, uh, and John Hayward told us that yesterday, Fort Myers itself is basically an island because it has water all the way around it. Uh, we, We have seen some video from yesterday, not really much video from this morning, a couple of pieces, but from yesterday of the devastation and the water that was running down the streets of, uh, of Fort Myers, I told you about on my Facebook page, and anybody can access my Facebook page, by the way. I'm not limited to your 5,000 number and all that, so jump in there even if we're not officially friends. A shark swimming up a street in, in Fort Myers. Homes completely uh, removed from their foundation and floating. And, um, and, and, of course, boats, because a lot of those people that live in that area have boats, and they were tied uh, tied up. And those boats have been removed, and then they're floating all over the place. It's just a a mess. The main thing they're concerned about right now is power and down power lines. Lots of questions about that. Governor DeSantis had pre-positioned close to 50,000 of those linemen there to move in and get ready to get busy. Well, they haven't been able to do that because of the flooded waters. But there's a lot of concern about how many of those lines may actually be in the water. And uh, if that's a situation and people get out and they start Assessing the damage and they're walking around in water, well, you can only imagine what a down power line would do. So uh, there are uh, warnings to not come out. You know, if you can stay inside, stay inside. Unfortunately, some of the homes are completely flooded. Uh, we've been told that some folks were on the roofs and some folks were in the, the second story of their homes as well, trying to get away from rising water and uh, and homes that are completely full. And, and then uh, we're also told about businesses that have water inside of them as well. The cleanup, the rebuild is going to take forever. It's going to take a very long time, months and months and months. And we haven't even started to talk about supply chain issues, right? Trying to get lumber and steel and aluminum and workers. You know, we have a big worker shortage going on in this country. Trying to get workers there and get them positioned so that they can start the rebuilding effort. This is going to take a long, long time for the people uh, in Florida. It came ashore, again, the size of Ohio, the entire state of Ohio is a Cat 4, moved across the state into the central part of the state. And my friends, Ross and Hope, and then Helen uh, Torres, who we spoke with earlier, now, Ross and Hope are in Lakeland, which is halfway between Tampa and uh, Orlando, and Helen evacuated from Tampa to go up to Orlando, and she's staying in a high-rise hotel with her family. 
They said it sounded like a train came running through their living room all night long. It sound like they've never heard before. And both of them have been through these storms that have been through hurricanes and uh, have experienced this kind of thing before. So that's pretty much where we are. Uh, who is this? Lieutenant Kendall Dunn. Is that correct? And uh, Hurricane, um, let's see, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Kendall Dunn is joining us on the Stevens Roofing Newsmaker Hotline, and he is a uh, hurricane hunter. Lieutenant, thank you very much for your time this morning. Uh, good morning. Major Dunn, how are you? Major Dunn. Okay, great to have you on this morning. Thank you for your yes, time. Sir, my, my, my name is Trey, and it's good to talk with you. Uh, yes, I just wanted to talk about, you know, hurricane hunters and flying into these storms. And uh, I don't know, did you did you actually make this mission? Was this one you went into? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, wow. I was in it yesterday. It was pretty uh, pretty intense. We we got it. Uh, it was about 50 miles from making landfall. So it was just about five hours or so from making landfall. And so when you when you do that, you know, how how is that? What is that like to fly an airplane into a Category 4? Yeah, so um, I tell you, this one was different than any other one I had been through. My first flight into um, a storm, we actually flew through a mesocyclone, which is an airborne tornado, and I thought that was bad. But, it, you know, it was pretty controllable. I know it sounds crazy, but this one yesterday, uh, be honest with you, sir, it uh, it rocked it rocked us. We had um, 12 crew and about, you know, eight media members, so we had about 20 folks on board. And uh, you have about six, seven people on headsets. And as we started to go through the storm wall on our third pass, we knew it was going to be bad. And uh, I told everybody to shut up, sit down, and I don't want to hear anything except me and the other pilot talking to each other, trying to get through it. And it it was rough. I'll tell you right now, we got through the eye wall and, and got into the center. Definitely took a, a, a breath. And if I could have taken a knee and had a drink of water, I definitely would have. Yeah, they say when you get into the – you know, into the eye itself, it's uh, pretty peaceful and can be actually sunny inside the yeah. eye. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. That's normally where you uh, take a break if you have to use the bathroom or uh, need to get a little something to eat. Throw it in the microwave, take a break. But yesterday it was just really intense. I had no time for that. It was it was really busy. The most intense you've ever been in? Ever, hundred percent. Matter of fact, um, we have a sister service, Noah. Everybody knows Noah, but they actually have. Uh, aviation as well and they have a p3 and they do research and they fly through slightly different missions um but we were in there basically the same time at different altitudes and they were doing some research stuff with a drone and uh when they got through and, and i'll just say it was kind of funny like i was trying to talk to them and they said stand by eye wall and i kind of giggled i was like huh i remember my first hurricane and then uh they got through the eye i said man that rocked us or whatever and then and then I was like, yeah, whatever. And then we went through it, and I called them. I said, man, that rocked us. I felt like we should have been holding hands and hugging because we needed some sympathy between each other. But it was uh, it was very intense. They um, they aborted one of their inbound runs and went home. And I'll be honest, we, we were ahead of them on our last run-in. And I wish we would have aborted because it was terrible. Wow. Um, yes, sir. What do you experience when you're going through that? What happens to the airplane and you? Yeah, so, you know, most things, honestly, the uh, the airplane itself, you know, you get up in the upper atmospheres and jet streams, airplanes have no idea. You know, they're flying with a 200-knot tailwind or a 200-knot te- headwind. It doesn't know. It's going to fly basically the same. But for us, what happens, the closer you get to the eye wall, the stronger the storm is, mentally what starts happening, you cannot explain the amount of water that's airborne. I don't, I don't understand it. I, you know, I read and try to understand it, but certain amount of hail that's just hanging in the air. It sounded like we were going through, you know, a dump truck full of rocks was in front of you on the interstate, just throwing rocks out the back, just the amount of hail rain. You look like you're underwater. Um, we've all like, you know, been in a boat and maybe stuck our hand in or something, just the amount of water that's covering the airplane. Mentally it challenges you because, you know, our, uh, operator's manual in the WC one thirty J says, you know, avoid heavy precipitation. And guess what we do every time we fly in it? Um, so we it, it's, it gets pretty intense. Of course, uh, most of us will never be put into that situation. So having you explain that to us, you know, we get on an airplane and we have a little bit of turbulence and you hear people kind of 
holler or make a noise or gasp yeah. for air in the cabin yeah. when there's just a little bit of turbulence, you know, and the pilots start searching for a place there there's not turbulence. You talk about turbulence. You guys are pretty much beat to death up there, aren't you? Uh, yeah, we can be. You know, and people ask us all the time, like you do, it's like, oh, it's got to be terrible. And, you know, and there's bumps, but it just happens, like, really fast, right? You have a similar taking off an airliner if you're in a hot day, you get those bumps. We get those a little more extreme, but it's pretty – quick in and out in and out of bumps but yesterday it was um five minutes of almost i mean it wasn't terrified but it was uh basically like a pure terry like man i hope this thing holds together because we pushed the extremes of it yesterday i was about to ask you are your planes specially equipped for this structurally do they do anything with the winds uh, with the wing structure or anything uh, no sir the uh these j models uh they're about 20 years old you know there's there's inspections that cover all that but Basically, they're just a it's just a dump truck of a tough aircraft, been around forever. But basically, what we do is just slow down to we call it a turbulent uh, turbulent uh, penetration airspeed. Mm-hmm. Kind of similar, mm-hmm. like you know, if you go over a speed bump, you're not going to go over it at 50. You're going to slow down to five, kind of thing. So that's what we do, and the plane stressors can really take it. But the problem is when that aircraft starts going, you know, side to side, and then turning. Uh, laterally, if you side load, if you can imagine, and it, it it really gets your attention. It's not fun. How many six sacks did the uh, did the folks in the back use? <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Um, we were going through the eye wall. We we're rocking pretty good, and our load master in the back said, "We have a puker." Yeah. And as soon as and as soon as he said that, <laughs> my eyes started watering, and I'm like, "Oh, I wish you wouldn't have said that." <laughs> so anyway, we we had a couple of media on board, you know, carrying yeah. their. Uh, Nothing exactly. smells worse than that up there, man. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> no, All right. Well, I'm glad they were on the way back. Yeah, right. Well, we we are glad that you're safe on the ground, and thank you for peeling back the veil and letting us see what it's like to fly into the middle of one of these. And, again, the major says it's the worst he's ever been in. Right, sir? Yes, sir, 100%. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time, uh, Major, and thank you for what you do. Absolutely. Appreciate you. That's Major Pilot uh, Major Kendall Dunn, 53rd Weather Recon Squadron, joining us here on KTSA. Back after the break, I want to tell you about our friends over at the Tank Depot. At the Tank Depot, you not only get outstanding service, you get a product that's built to last and help you have a constant supply of water. We are watching our friends and family over in Florida right now, and unfortunately many of them will not have water for several days. And the water that will be available, some of it is going to be contaminated. You see these stories about the shelves being completely emptied out anytime there's a disaster. We've had it happen right here. Everybody makes the HEB run. They grab every bottle of water that you can find. Well, if you had a tank on your property from the Tank Depot, you wouldn't have to water about a, worry about a constant water supply. You would always have a water supply for you and your your family, and you know that water is life. And if you have an ag uh, you know system where you're out in the middle of the country somewhere and you've got animals you've got to feed or you've got crops you've got to water, of course, our friends at the Tank Depot have gigantic tanks for that. If you have a, uh, a retail business and you'd like to stock and sell the tanks from the Tank Depot, they're looking for business partners as well. They're right here in San Antonio. They're in Dripping Springs and in Buda as well. Be sure you tell them Trey said hi when you give them a call to the Tank Depot, 210-648-3866. Did you-